I'm, I'm really happy to be going now because I feel like some of the things that I want to talk about have come up repeatedly over the course of uh, several of the talks. So I hope we can <clears throat> that I can get through this faster and then we can, uh, we can talk about the connections or not. Uh, so I want to start with a, 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 an excerpt from a one minute video that I recommend you all uh, watch of Richard Feynman at Cornell in, the, in 1964. And he explains science in a very succinct way in, a, in his charming Brooklyn accent. Uh, and he basically says, you know, when we're, when we're looking for a new law, we, we, we make a guess. We have a hypothesis. Uh, we then make some predictions about what that hypothesis would imply if true. And then we go and we look in the world and we, we get some observations or we rely on our experience or we run an experiment. And if the, uh, if the predictions don't agree with what we observe, then, then, our, then our theory is wrong. Uh, and then he goes on to say, it doesn't matter how smart you are or how famous you are or how many papers you published in AJS, um, uh, the, the theory is wrong. Uh, and so this is a very sort of nice, succinct uh, description of, of you know, how we sort of learn about the scientific method. Um, uh, and even though, and I'll get to this in a moment, uh, I think that a lot of sociologists would react to, to Feynman's uh, prescription as overly simplistic and ignoring lots of other things that we know are true, uh, uh, they would agree with much of it. Right, if they were sort of pinned down and, and uh, forced to. Because when we, when, we, when we talk about explanation, and I, I really think this is true, uh, what we mean is a causal explanation in this particular sense, which is uh, you know, if X had not happened, Y would have been different. Right? And, and this is uh, just a sort of another way of expressing really the, the standard Rubin counterfactual model uh, from statistics, right? So I, I, I think that almost everybody, almost all of us mean this, and, and very often uh, the word explanation and causal explanation are, are used so interchangeably that, 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 uh, uh, that uh, it's not really worth distinguishing between them. Uh, and then there's a long history in the philosophy of, of science about uh, exactly this point that Feynman is making, where if you are talking about a causal explanation, if you are claiming that you have some understanding of X causing Y, then whether you admit it or not, you're, you're making predictions. And so you should make those predictions uh, explicitly uh, and uh, you should be able to test them. Uh, and if you're, if you're not doing that, then, then you're just telling stories. Right? So this is you know, Hempel and Oppenheim uh, and there's, you know, a long tradition of, of, of social scientists, you know, pr probably more so in economics than in, than in sociology, uh, agreeing with that. Um, and interestingly, a long history of sociologists not agreeing with that. So we can talk about that. Um, and I, I think that, uh, so then this is maybe the controversial point in this slide here is that, uh, is that if we go and read uh, 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 quantitative or qualitative work, published in, in you know, leading social science journals, we, we, we really never see people doing what Feynman is doing on the board. Right? Instead, what we might see is something that sort of sounds a little bit like that because we call it hypothesis testing, but hypothesis testing doesn't actually test hypotheses, right? It actually rejects null hypotheses, right? So we have some theory that says, I think, uh, you know, if my, if my theory is uh, correct, then uh, then this coefficient should be positive, and I now try to reject the null hypothesis that it's zero, right? Which is actually not the same thing as saying, well, what would be the implications of my theory if it were correct? Now let's go look and see if those things are true. Nevertheless, in the conclusion discussion section of the, the same papers, we do actually talk as if we are explaining things and as if these explanations have consequences for, for potential policy makers. And there's a wonderful paper that I encourage you all to read by Ward in 2010, where he, it's called The Perils of, of Policy by P-Value. And he spells out very carefully uh, uh, examples from you know, very well-known theories in political science, um, where they're talking about civil war, and they do the standard kind of regression analysis, and they find that, the, uh, that some uh, coefficient is, is significant. And they really make very explicit recommendations about you know, how one should avoid civil wars. But it turns out that these, that these same models are not at all predictive of civil wars happening, okay? Um, so this 
this sort of first slide inevitably starts a whole bunch of arguments about um, you know, what social scientists are doing and why they're doing it. And uh, you know, we'll probably have some of these arguments uh, in the discussion. Uh, but there are lots of, I would say, excuses for not doing prediction. Uh, and um, the only one that I think is right is this one, right? Uh, which is that, in fact, our theories don't make very precise predictions. And so it's really difficult to do that, right? That Feynman has an idea of a theory which comes from physics where just sort of very naturally makes a prediction. So, of course, you follow the scientific method. And very often in social science, if we, you know, if we say something like, um, you know, um, uh, you know, feelings of power make people less cooperative, right? I mean, that sounds like a theory, but it's not clear what the statistical test is that you're going to perform to test that theory, right? And so you might say, well, I don't really know what the implications of my theory are for things in the world, and so I, I don't know what kind of predictions I should make. And I would say, fine, that's fair enough, but then you don't get to claim that you have explanations of things or that you have policy recommendations either, right? So if you, so if you want to... If you want to say, you know, the implications of my theory are, right, or if you want to just kind of insinuate that so that the reader has the impression that the implications of your theory are, then you should actually go test those implications, right? You have, in fact, made a prediction even if you haven't articulated it in a way that can be tested. So I would further say, without sort of confusing my own argument too much, that that some of this confusion about what we're doing when we offer explanations uh, uh, in, in social science goes all the way back to, to Weber, where in the same sentence he says, uh, sociology is about causal explanations and sociology is about interpretive understanding, right? And what is not clear about this sentence is whether Weber thinks that uh, interpretive uh, understanding is the same thing as a causal explanation or is just sort of a, you know, uh, an and, right, an additional, whether these are two things or the same thing, right? Uh, and, and that's a problem because they really are very different, right? That a causal explanation has the properties that I just described, right? It necessarily makes predictions and therefore could be evaluated in terms of the predictions that it makes uh, in an ex-ante sense Whereas an interpretive explanation has none of these properties, right? An interpretive explanation uh, is, is by definition a, an ex post thing. It's something that we do after the fact once we already know the outcome. Uh, and it's, it, all it has to do is make us feel like we've understood something, right? So it's an internal subjective response where we're like, ah, okay, that makes sense, right? But, ah, that makes sense is not the same thing as like, okay, now, now I can predict what's going to happen over here in some other situation or tomorrow uh, or under some other set of circumstances. It's just like that thing makes sense, right? And what I would propose is that in sociology and in social science and in just in the media and everywhere in the world that we look, we are just switching back and forth between these two things uh, whenever it suits us, right? So we are... We're sort of talking about our explanations as if they're doing this, but actually this is what we're doing, right? That we are, we are making sense of things and we're coming up with stories that make us feel good. And then we're pretending or we're, we're allowing other people to infer that we have explained something. And so, in fact, neither of these things implies the other. You can have a perfectly satisfying, interpretable, plausible explanation that makes no predictions or for which all the predictions are wrong uh, and you can have, of course, as we've already talked about, uh, in your black box predictive models that potentially could do quite well that are completely uninterpretable and offer no insight whatsoever. Okay? So you, 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 can, you can have uh, one or the other, and you could have both, right? And in fact, we would love to have both, and it would be a, a sort of desirable state of, of social science if we could get to a place where we have uh, models that are both interpretable and also predictive, and, and, and in fact, we could go even further and say are, are causal in the, in the sort of formal sense of identifying, uh, correctly identifying the, the causal mechanisms. And, <clears throat> uh, and, and of course, and there are in fact efforts underway to try, you know, we, interpretable machine learning is such a, uh, an effort to try to uh, have the best of both worlds in some sense. So uh, it's not 
uh, out of the question that we can have both. But it's, it's also not something that comes about by accident, right? This is, a, this is a, an objective that would have to be sought after quite deliberately. Um, and there may be real trade-offs uh, involved and we could ask questions about you know, how severe those trade-offs are. It may be that, that the trade-offs are benign, that you can have like pretty good predictive models that are reasonably interpretable and so you don't have a, a, a bad trade-off or it might be the opposite. That's something that we have to go and, and, and discover. And of course, uh, as we've also talked about, you know, there are uh, uses of interpretation and interpretability that are, that are not primarily explanatory, right? If you're trying to convince somebody of something, if you're trying to achieve legitimacy, if you're trying to do, uh, uh, you know, if you're, if you're trying to sort of get somebody to understand you and what you're saying, uh, you know, interpretability has all kinds of advantages. Uh, you know, I certainly think that, um, that, but these have to do with interpretability being valuable in and of itself, right? And that's a very, uh, that's different from interpret interpretability being valuable because it's doing something else, right? So that I think is, you know, if you remember nothing else from this talk, uh, this is what I want to emphasize, right? You can, you cannot have your cake and eat it, right? Um, that you can, you can want things to be interpretable or plausible. Um, there's nothing wrong with wanting those things, right? They are, they are properties that you can say, well, that's important to me, right? I want my explanations to be interesting. I don't like boring explanations, right? Um, uh, so you can't be wrong about that. It's just a preference, right? And so we, of course, as social scientists can say, I have 11 minutes and 47 seconds on my clock here, um, Victor. So you can't be wrong about that. But, but it's misleading to say, oh, I care about interpretability because really what matters is generalization, right? Or, 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 or you know, uninterpretable models aren't causal, right? So these are the kinds of arguments that people make in favor of interpretability. And they're, they're just, they're, they're certainly not right. And they could very well be wrong, right? And so I, I think that uh, that uh, you know, we should be clear about why we care about interpretability, and if we're not willing to make predictions based on our uh, our theories, then uh, then we shouldn't also shouldn't claim to have an explanation, right? So I think it's it's fine to say, oh look, all I'm doing is describing things, right? And this is just a description of a sequence of events that happened, and that's all I'm doing. Fine, that's a totally legitimate exercise. But you can't sort of slip in a, uh, and, and therefore, it suggests that at the end of your argument, which is a, you know, which is a, a, a causal claim, right? And so uh, finally, just to sort of, uh, to demonstrate that I'm, I'm not just picking on us, I'm also picking on computer scientists, uh, that, that if you, that, that you're not out of the woods, uh, just because you suddenly start making predictions. In fact, there's another whole can of worms that you immediately land in as soon as you, start, as soon as you say, okay, great, let's, do, let's, make, let's turn everything into a prediction exercise. And Matt has been discovering this very painfully uh, over the course of running the, the Fragile Families uh, Challenge. You can see all the same, I would say really all of the same problems that show up in Fragile Families also show up in a, in a much a simpler, almost trivial setting of just predicting the number of retweets that a tweet is going to get on Twitter, right? So this is like almost nothing could be more trivial than this. Um, we also have a tremendous amount of data. Uh, we have a tremendous number of features for all of our observations. You know, if, if machine learning can do anything well in social science, it ought to be this. And in fact, there's lots of people doing this. Uh, when we started doing this several years ago, uh, we actually found, you know, a little bit better R squared than what Matt found, but not much better. Lots of other people then said, okay, we can do better. Um, and if you read these papers, again, the sort of, the, the, the words in the paper are written by humans to persuade other humans. Uh, and these seem like they're doing a lot better, right? And in fact, they are really claiming that. That's the whole point of these papers is that they're doing better. Uh, you know, maybe they're just trying to beat the baseline, uh, uh, but you know, they're actually also making quite, um, um, you know, uh, 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 you know, absolute statements of, of performance, high accuracy, excellent performance, etc.
Uh, so you might read these papers and think, oh wow, what a, you know, it's a tremendous amount of progress. Like we're getting better, we have better models, we're explaining things better. Um, but it turns out that, that that's not true, right? That in fact, uh, what is happening here is everybody's using a different measure of prediction. They're, they're, they're subsetting their data in different ways. They're using different uh, outcome metrics. Uh, and in a, a paper uh, published last year with Jake Hoffman and Amit Sharma, we, we uh, uh, performed what we call the Garden of Forking Paths exercise, where we took the same, a single data set and a single model right, on the data set. And then we, we just changed the prediction task from simple regression to let's put, make a threshold and, and build a classifier out of our regression model. So it's the same underlying model, but just a different use of the model. Uh, and then for each of these two tasks, we picked uh, three different metrics. And then for each of these three different metrics, we picked different uh, rules for what you were going to exclude, right? And it turns out, so now we have this, uh, uh, how many is that, four, eight, 12, uh, uh, 21 different results, right? 21 different papers generated from the same underlying data set. Uh, and it turns out you can get almost any result that's published in the literature from the same model on the same data, right? So, so just because you're doing prediction doesn't mean that you're somehow being objective uh, or that you are uh, somehow able to compare your results with anybody else's results, right? So, uh, so there are lots of problems. Right, there's no robustness there, right? <laughs> that, that if you want robustness, you have to, that has to come from somewhere else, right? And, and one solution, of course, is Matt's solution, which is you have a contest where there's a set of rules and, there's, uh, and, and it's clear what the data is and what the outcome metric is and, and how you go about you know, training your models and evaluating them. A final point that I want to make uh, is that if we did all of this carefully, we might start to see the kind of results that Matt is seeing, which is, you know, maybe there's only so well we can do, and maybe that isn't very good, right? I mean, and what very good is, is a, is a, is a uh, you know, um, a value judgment that depends on the context and also on your expectations, but certainly when you see results like, you know, everything's worse than 0.23, most people are like, hmm, that doesn't seem very good, right? Um, and, and so, you know, why is that? Uh, and you could sort of, uh, a, a sort of toy model for thinking about what might be going on is that, you know, you in, here's the world, here's your observational data. Now imagine you can just, you have some idealized model where you get to condition on things and you can, now you can measure everything and you have the perfect model. Um, so in, in this sort of perfect world, you're conditioning on, you know, in, in the Twitter case, just the awesomeness of the tweet. So it's just how great is this tweet? Like great things spread and bad things don't spread. I don't know how to define great. I'm just gonna skip over that and say, let's say you do, I give you your magic wand that just tells you how, uh, or your magic little meter that tells you how great a tweet is. Now you can condition on that. In one type of world, you're done, right? Your R squared is one. You condition on, you, 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 you label everything by awesomeness. And, and now your, your model uh, has very low variance, right? Uh, in a luck world, it, it doesn't help you at all. Okay, so determining what kind of world we're operating in, I think, has something to say about what the limits are to what we, what we can predict. And, and certainly for, for Twitter, that doesn't seem to be very good. And we find a similar result to what Matt finds, which is that, that you know, the fanciest, most complicated machine learning model uh, does essentially no better than a linear model with one feature. Um, and so you know, the simple model does as well as the complicated model and the complicated model doesn't do very well. And, and maybe that's just the world that we live in um, and we should be thinking carefully about what that means both for computer science, you know, can we, can we have a, a language for describing this? Like how do we, how could we sort of in some sense uh, determine you know, theoretically what we should expect to find so that we don't waste our time trying to build better and better models when we can't do any better. And for social science, uh, we should think carefully about what that means for our explanations, including maybe we can't explain some things that we would like to be able to explain. Um, so uh, that's it. Um, prediction is, is not a sufficient condition for uh, explanation, but it's certainly necessary.
uh, predictive checks can be useful for, for, for measuring and comparing explanatory power of different theories uh, and, and, uh, and, and possibly also limit what, what we can explain at all um, in the sense that we, uh, that we mean when we talk about explaining things. But prediction on its own doesn't get you uh, out of trouble uh, because there's lots of ways to abuse it and to game it. And so we really need to be thinking of these two things uh, as complements to each other where the, the predictive, the rules of prediction come from the substantive questions that we're trying to answer or the applications that we have in mind uh, and then the, the explanations that we come up with are in turn disciplined by the predictions that they make. Thank you. Right, let the fighting begin. <laughs> Please. So just to clarify, the meaning of prediction here, I think it's just, there are two different things. So one is predicting the outcome, um, the y hat, as Matt described it. But then the other way you use prediction in the beginning is what would have happened had I changed x in this way. Mm -hmm. So that's the beta hat. And they're both predictive in the sense that if my theory says that beta hat should be in this direction, then I can still test my explanation with regard to that. Or I might kind of take up um, you know, the fragile families challenge and say, okay, I'm gonna put in everything that I know. I'm not interested in, interested in beta hat, but I'm interested in knowing what the overall performance is. And in a way, kind of, you don't get much information. Let's say I do out of sample testing and I find that 20% of the time I'm right. And all I've learned is that I don't know much, which is still helpful, which is still kind of avoiding overfitting. But in the other sense, you know, the beta hat and the causal inference question is something that we have really cared about. But in a way, we've kind of given up on that because our questions are too complicated. Um, so we kind of do these descriptive models, but then write it up in this causal language. And I think the solution there is, in a way, so the pre-registering and all that is like, these are alternative solutions. But the alternative solution is kind of coming up with specific descriptions of our causal models, even if we can't t test everything in our, um, uh, in our model, we can still be clear about what assumptions would it take for this explanation to be a causal explanation. I think what I would call for is basically pushing us to specify what we're missing, the data that we're missing, and being transparent about that without kind of waving our hands and saying that, okay, I have this association and this means that. Mm. What are the underlying assumptions there? And to me, that seems entirely in line with our current agenda without kind of referring, not using ML methods necessarily. Um, anyway, so this is like, this is just the point that I wanted to make, that there are two ways we can understand prediction here, and they're not necessarily at odds, and I think we should move in in both directions. If we're predicting an outcome, we should do our sample tests. We have to have a benchmark to test ourselves against without kind of overfitting our data, but at on the other hand, if we're not doing that, then we should kind of think really carefully about what our beta hat represents and what it's not So specifically, uh, the beta hat is it's the change in x for a unit change in y. It's inherently a prediction. That number is a prediction in the change in y that you get if you change x. That's right, so if we so if we so if we switch to effect sizes, yeah. right, then it turns out that that is equivalent to r squared, right? So, so that it, I believe that is a mathematical proof. No, absolutely not. Well, so we should we should talk about it because I, Jake just showed me a paper about this the other day. So, that 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 omitted variable bias. That's the difference between just raw predicting y hat or predicting you know y conditional on x. When we're doing regression analysis for treatment effect estimation, we're trying to minimize omitted variable bias. We've got the omitted variable bias formula that we're focusing on. Okay, 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 so let, let's try to clarify the debate here, right? So, so first point over here that yes, it's true that if I say I predict that my coefficient is not zero, that is a prediction, right? I am, but what I'm talking about is the y hat prediction, right? Because I don't think that gets you very far, right? It doesn't, that is not a prediction about your theory. That is a prediction about a null hypothesis. Right? It could be, though, if you it have a graphical like, model of... Which is something you don't believe, yes. right? It yes. is, it, what it's saying is, this thing that I don't believe isn't true, right? And all I'm showing is that it isn't true. It doesn't show that your theory is true, right? Or even predictive, okay? So that's the first point. 
I think the second point here is there is a, absolutely a difference between. Sorry, I'm not sure. Well, so the, the, the way, right, so, okay, yes. So if you are, if you say the, with some p value, I can reject my null hypothesis, yeah. that doesn't say anything about your theory. Yeah. It just says that the null hypothesis is wrong, okay? Yeah. So, so hypothesis testing is not actually hypothesis testing, it's null hypothesis testing, okay? So that's the first point. The second point, which I think you're bringing up, is, is that you're not getting any causal identification out of predicting y hat. And I totally agree with that, right? Um, and so I, I'm, not, I'm actually not even, uh, all I'm saying here is that if you, if you do have a causal explanation, that should make predictions about the outcome, right? Just because you make predictions about the outcome doesn't mean you have a causal explanation. So necessary but not sufficient. Right? And I think that all the stuff that we you know, know separately about identification and you know, natural experiments and you know, all the econometrics and everything uh, definitely applies for, for making causal claims. But this is a somewhat weaker claim, which is just to say if we, if we, if we want to like get to the point where we're uh, where we want to, uh, you know, say that our theory is explaining anything, we, we have to be able to make predictions, and we're not doing that yet. Okay. Yes? So, so there's been a long-standing debate in social science that is at the tension of the point that you made about favor, the interpretive and the explanatory. Yeah. And is it fair to really hold up Feynman and physics as the gold standard for the social sciences because in physics it's a very precise uh, mm -hmm. science and the precision itself comes from in part that they're dealing with inanimate uh, objects and uh, questions about them and the behavior and human beings and this gets to the earliest debates mm -hmm. in the social science are conscious reflexive actors that can socially learn mm -hmm. and change their behavior. And that adds a huge dimension of complexity, which makes it much more mm -hmm. difficult to then say our theories are right or wrong if we could, unless we make the right prediction, as Feynman could do in physics. Okay, so you said two things there, and one of them I agree with, and then you said something right at the very end that I don't okay. agree with, right? So, so, with so the one that you, the one that, you, that I agree with is that right. physics is a bad model for social science okay. to follow. I totally agree with that. You know, like we've wasted 200 years like trying to be like physics, and now we have a bunch of physicists who are trying to help us be like physics, and that's not very helpful, yeah. right? Um, uh, for all the reasons that you point out, right? Um, uh, but. I, what I think, what Feynman is saying, you know, I think is certainly influenced by his background in physics and it's easier to do in physics, but the principle of saying, I think I know how things work, right? Like once you say that, then you should make a prediction, right? Because if you know how, th if that's true, if you know how things work, then you should be able to say how they will work in some other context, right? That is a prediction. And all I'm saying is, like, do that. Do that and check. Now, how you do that, like the type of prediction that it might be, there could be lots of types. You could say, well, I'm going to make predictions about individual people, right? And or I'm going to make predictions about populations of people, right? Or I'm going to make predictions about distributions of things, right? So Music Lab, that paper makes <laughs> predictions about not being able to make predictions. Right? So it seems like that doesn't make a prediction. But we did make a prediction, which is that as you increase the social influence, the distribution is going to change in, in a particular way. Right? And then you can go check that prediction. Right? And, so, and that's what we did in an experiment. So, so, you, so that you can make distributional predictions, you can make population average predictions, you can make uh, individual outcome predictions, and the accuracy that you should expect to get could be very different for those different classes of predictions. And you could do this with qualitative work as well, right? You know, an ethnographer could say, well, I went and studied this neighborhood, and here's what I think is going on. And I think that generalizes. So now I should be able to go to a different neighborhood and do the same thing that I did here and come to the same conclusion. That is also a prediction, right? You don't have to be doing uh, st you know, statistics to, to make predictions. But all it is is just the discipline of saying, I think I know what's going on. That implies something. Let me go check that something. And if you're not willing to do that, you don't get to claim that you 
think that you know what's going on. So we agree on the second point too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I thought you. I thought you were. I thought you. Were, okay, great. Yes. Um, yeah. I, th I think I'm completely on board with your uh, point about prediction, actually. Um, especially the first, that it's a necessary condition for an explanation to be causal. And um, but what I'm wondering about is what your current perspective is on the role of Verstehen and the uh, understanding. Mm. I think that in your AGS paper, you were kind of maybe was somewhat harsh in a later debate with, uh, with Ezra, um, maybe a little, uh, a little bit more accommodating. Um, but I'm thinking of like two models, say uh, Paul Krugman, who kind of pre-registers his prediction about all kinds of things in the social world on his Twitter account, and then uh, later <laughs> yeah, yeah. selectively that he was... Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can cheat with pre-registration too, it turns out. Yeah. <laughs> and then you say 538, which predicts yeah. the election really well, uh, although not the last one. Um, Unclear. And so... <laughs> I was wondering, so um, the Nobel Prize economist perhaps has more of a notion of staying in there where um, there's an implicit model or understanding of the world that allows him to make prediction on all kinds of seemingly unrelated phenomena or weakly related phenomena. So is that perhaps where staying comes in, is that maybe it doesn't help you maximize predictability in a particular context, but as we try to understand a very heterogeneous multifaceted social world, um, it helps to mm -hmm. have a, a, an understanding of how mm -hmm. things work in one context. Okay. And, yeah, and it, even if the predictability of that model in that one context isn't very good. But it's interesting that you thought I was more accommodating in the response than in the original essay. I thought I was less accommodating in the response. <laughs> but I was really happy to have the chance to do that because it really you know, over time I have, like, so I think, clarified my thinking. And, and so I think the response actually is a better explanation of what I'm saying than the original paper. Um, and the point I make there is, like, you know, not only do I think there's nothing wrong with Verstein, I can't imagine how one could do sociology without it, right? It would just be impossible, right? Um, but the way, the role that I see it playing is as a hypothesis generation engine, right? That we have intuitions for things uh, that allow us to, to formulate hypotheses about what we think is going on, okay? And, and you could, that could also come from mathematical modeling or agent-based models or, or, you know, field data or like th whatever you want to do, sit and think about the world, you know, whatever you do, you generate your hypotheses somehow. But then you have to test it. And the, the point that I was making is that Verstehen is not suitable for testing your hypothesis. But that is often what we do. In fact, you know, outside of social science, that's pretty much all we do, right? If something sounds plausible, people are like, that sounds right, done, you know? Put that in the New York Times, right? Um, uh, and, and, you know, and surprisingly, or disappointingly, much of what we do in social, inside of social science also ends up being a lot like that as well, where if something is a, you know, if it's an anticipated outcome, the reviewers are more likely to agree with you and you know you're more likely to get published and whereas if you say something that people think is just totally implausible like they're not going to like that right so I, I think that we are very often in practice using Verstein as a way to evaluate explanations and that's the thing that I think is wrong right but I don't know how you do the first part what Feynman is calling guessing it right the hypothesis generation. I don't know how you would do that without, without Verstein. <laughs>